Welcome everyone to our last uh, meeting of the Western Virtual Symbolectic Seminar for the spring semester. Uh, we're very happy to have Olga Plamenevskaya telling us about links of surface singularities, Stein versus Milner fillings. Right. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, we'll start in a moment. I want to say that this is a joint work with Laura Starkstone. And incidentally, Laura gave a talk on the same topic this morning in a different seminar. I'm trying to look at the participant list to see if there are people who attend both talks, who are going to attend both talks. If you were in Laura's talk and you have questions, feel free to ask them. It will be very helpful. If And everyone, if you have questions at any moment, please interrupt me. Please ask questions. There's kind of a lot in the story. Uh, and now let's start. Uh, so I'm going to first set the stage for just talking about symplectic feelings in general. Uh, this will be about three-dimensional contact manifolds. So my contact manifolds are closed, oriented, and contact structures oriented. And the symplectic feeling is simply a symplectic four manifold with boundary, uh, where the boundary is given by my three manifold. And there should be some compatibility condition. At the very least, the symplectic structure should be positive on the contact planes, or they can be stronger conditions, strong symplectic feelings, time feelings. Uh, we'll get there when we need it. And the more general questions about symplectic feelings that you can ask given a contact three manifold is whether feelings exist in general, what are the properties, if you can classify the feelings. Classifications exist rarely, and there are contact structures that are not fillable. This is kind of a rich topic, and especially when your contact manifold is three dimensional, there are tools both from symplectic and low dimensional topology that you can use. Okay, in this talk, I'm going to focus on something that has relations to algebraic geometry. So, this is going to be about feelings for canonical contact structures on length of singularities. So let me tell you what links and what this is about. Okay. So my setting is that I have a complex surface with an isolated singularity at zero. Think of this surface as sitting in some large complex space. Uh, and the link is what you get if you take your complex surface and intersect it with a small sphere centered at this isolated singular point. Okay. So this is a schematic picture here. Uh, you may wonder if the resulting three manifold is going to be smooth, if it's going to depend on the radius of the sphere you take. If the radius is small enough, you have transverse intersection, you have a smooth manifold, and it turns out that it's independent of the choice of particular choice of the sphere. Moreover, it turns out that this three dimensional link actually de determines the topology of the surface singularity in the sense that you can imagine a singular point topologically as being a cone on that three manifold. If you're interested in the analytic structure and the algebraic geometry, this is subtle because, of course, the analytic structure is not something that you can read or read off the, the, the link in general. Okay. I'm interested in contact topology. So importantly for us, this extra structure, this link is a contact manifold. And the contact structure comes from complex tangencies on this three manifold, you can check that you get a non-integrable two-plane field, so you do get a contact structure. It also turns out that this contact structure up to contact, up to contact morphism, I believe, is independent of choices that you made. It also turns out that this contact structure is always fillable. There's always a symplectic feeling or even Stein feelings. You can sort of see it from the schematic picture of the surface singularity because you have the link and you sort of have the surface X filling your contact link, except that, of course, this is a singular surface and you require fillings to be smooth, but you can work with a single point and kind of improve on this to get a smooth fillings. So you should think about resolutions and smoothings of this singularity. Okay, what is that about? So let me tell you first about the resolution and let me actually go over this in detail because we need it. So we start with this singular uh, point, single manifold, and you, you're looking for a smooth manifold to resolve the singularity, which would map to your singular surface, perhaps locally in the neighborhood of the singular point. The map should be a nice morphism one to one away from zero. And above zero, above the singular point, you're going to have some maybe complicated thing, complicated pre-image, which is called the exceptional divisor. And it basically encodes 
the data about your singularity it tells you how complicated the singularity is. Okay? So this uh, pre-image of zero under some nice conditions, you can think of it as being a normal crossing divisor, meaning that the inverse image of zero is the union of smooth complex curves that intersect transversally and the intersections are at double points only. So no triple intersections, no singularities and the exceptional curves. You can achieve that. Okay. And this way you can encode all the data about your resolution, at least all the topological data, if you record the data about these surfaces. So you need to say what the genus is for each, in, for each exceptional curve, what the, which curves, which exceptional curves intersect, which components of the exceptional device intersect. And you should also encode this self-intersection data for each curve. So you write down typically what's called a resolution graph and you label each vertex. So vertices correspond to these curves. You label each vertex by the self-intersection and the edges give you the intersection data, okay? Uh, so if I have this graph, sometimes it's called a plumbing graph for a reason, because now if you take these curves, these smooth, surfaces, if you think in real dimensions, smooth complex curves of the corresponding genera and build disk bundles over each surface according to the self-intersection data and then plumb them together as dictated by the graph, what you get, you basically get the, uh, you basically get the neighborhood of this exceptional divisor. So uh, this inverse image of zero, and this encodes the topology of the resolution. So in particular, you see your link Y as the boundary of this plumbing. Okay. So this is a very useful topological description. And it turns out that you also see the symplectic topology because you can just do this plumbing with recording the symplectic structure, you take the complex curves, you take the standard complex, the standard symplectic structure, the disk bundles, you plumb everything. So you get your link represented as the convex boundary of the standard symplectic neighborhood of this configuration of curves, okay? So I get a symplectic feeling. And if I started with a minimal resolution, which cannot be blown down, which does not have any negative one curves, then I can actually deform this symplectic structure to make it Stein. So you get a Stein theory. That's a non-trivial theorem of Bogomol of the elevator, but that's true. Any questions so far? Any questions about the resolutions? Okay, all right. So this is one way to get so backtracking here, started with the link and making a resolution of the complex surface is one way to get a symplectic feeling, a Stein feeling. And more ways would be if you take a, if you look at the smoothing of your complex surface. So again, what happens, you have this uh, surface with a singular point, and I want to just deform it a little bit, just kind of perturb it to get a smooth surface. And the basic example is when you have a hypersurface in C3, something like this very familiar thing whose length is the Poincaré homology sphere, you perturb the, so for this first equation, zero is the singularity, you perturb it a little bit, you get a smooth surface. And of course, this first picture up top tells you that if you look at this perturbation, you still have a filling of the contact length of the same contact manifold. So now you've gotten a, you've gotten a symplectic filling, even a Stein filling of the length of your singularity. Okay. So this procedure that we just did is called the smoothing of the singularity and the manifold that we got, the, this sort of the nearby fiber XT is called the Milner fiber and we represented the contact link as the boundary of the Milner fiber. Okay. I'm sweeping some details under the rug here. I'm not giving you a precise definition of a deformation or a smoothing in general, it should be understood abstractly as terms of some algebraic geometry flat families. And when you're not looking at a hypersurface singularity, it turns out that smoothings do not in general always exist. And more interestingly for us, you can have a variety of smoothings. For hypersurfaces, there's just one way to get a smooth surface. If this is something more complicated, you can have different smoothing components of the scale of the deformation space. So you can have different Miller fibers with different topology. So typically this would give you a variety, a finite number of different Stein fillings for a contact structure, okay? And there's a word of caution here. I told you in the beginning that this link determines the link Y XI determines the topology of the singularity, but you could technically have several 
analytic structures. So you don't, if you're just looking at the link, you don't really know what analytic singularity you're looking at. So if you want to generate as many Milner fibers as possible, as many time fittings as possible, in this construction, you need to think about what if I change the analytic structure, take something that's compatible with the same link, would that give me more Milner fibers? And sometimes it would give you some additional topologically different Milner fibers. So I need to look at this whole collection, possibly infinite collection of analytic structures. Any questions so far? Okay. So let's recap. I'm starting with the link of a complex surface singularity. And I have a collection of Stein feelings that come from smoothings. Uh, I also have a Stein feeling that comes from the minimal resolution. And the question that you want to ask, well, are there any additional feelings? So all of these first guys, they basically come from algebraic geometry. But I'm interested in symplectic geometry, in Stein geometry. Do I have any additional feelings? Okay. So this is my question. And this, if you like, fits into the context of comparing algebraic geometry information that provides you the Milner feeling to symplectic geometry that you expect to be less rigid and possibly there might be some additional stuff. Okay. Questions? So the known results. It turns out that even though you expect the symplectic geometry to be less rigid and maybe you expect more feelings on the just Stein side, uh, in a number of simple cases, it's known that all Stein feelings do come from resolutions and smoothings, okay? And in many cases, it's even known that all minimal symplectic fillings are also given by the algebraic geometry. So these basic cases that are known include, of course, everybody's favorite three-dimensional sphere, right? S3, no singularity, the only feeling is a mold. This is a classical result of Lashberg and Duff. Then there are land spaces where, again, Liska classified all the symplectic fillings. And it turns out that at least up to the epiomorphism, they all come from Milner fillings, from the algebraic geometry constructions. And the same holds for lengths of simple singularities and a little bit more generally for lengths of quotient singularities. I didn't write it down. Okay. So when your singularity is sort of uncomplicated, when you start out being very basic, then it does turn out that all Stein fillings are exhausted by what comes from the algebraic geometry. In general, though, it's known that Stein feelings are not are not always generated by those algebraic feelings, and some exotic feelings were given by Ahmed of Asbakchi, where they've done some smooth constructions to basically some surgeries to generate more Stein feelings. And how do you know that what you got is not a Milner feeling of anything? Well, they've constructed examples where B1 is not zero. And it's, not, it's known that for Milner fibers, every Milner fiber has B1 equal to zero. So this is, this is how you know. Okay. But these are some kind of isolated examples that Akhmed of Anesbakji give. And their singularities are fairly complicated. And maybe if you know about some parameters of singularities, everything in this first class is rational singularity, geometric gene is zero. So they're kind of uncomplicated. And going uh, going here, you get you get in particular the, the link is not a rational homology sphere, and this is what allows you to use homology to just detect that it's not it's not a Miller fiber. Okay, I don't know if I will use this terminology, but if my, in my paper with Laura we talked about unexpected feelings, which are Stein feelings, which do not come from algebraic geometry, which are Stein but not Miller. So, what do you expect? is given by resolution and smoothings. If you have more, you call them unexpected feelings. Okay. So uh, getting closer to what Laura and I did, we compare, we try to look for unexpected feelings and compare Milner and Stein feelings for what's called rational singularities that they used fundamental cycle. I'll give you a definition in a moment. This is kind of a long notion. I'm talking about what are those rational singularities. So they have, without going into algebraic geometry, that's something that has very uncomplicated algebraic geometry. And uh, also it's maybe uncomplicated topology. If you know a little bit of Heger-Floor theory for these guys, you always have that the links are L spaces. 
Uh, and also it has simple contact and symplectic geometry due to the fact that the contact links all have planar open books. I think you'll actually see how those planar open books can be constructed. And for planar open books, we know a lot about fillings. There's a theorem of Vandal that tells us that you can uh, describe all fillings by Lipschitz vibration with planar fiber. There are some results on how the topology is bound, it bounds on the early characteristic and so on. And there's even a conjectural result that there's finitely many, not, not result, but a conjecture that there might be finitely many fillings for such contact structures. Okay. So it's interesting that this is where we still see the uh, the discrepancy between the Milner side and the Stein side, the algebraic side and the symplectic side, even in this setting, we are able to find unexpected fillings. And it sort of looks like this is exactly the kind of borderline between the situations where you exhaust everything by algebraic geometry and when you don't, because we also have under some conditions on the framings, we have a uniqueness result where we do not get unexpected feelings. So it's pretty subtle and this is exactly the breaking line. Okay. So the examples that we construct, they include ciphered fiber spaces. They're really uncomplicated examples. And in particular, so this is just kind of one picture of a link and you can generalize this to many more spaces, many more sort of resolution graphs that kind of include something like this, include something similar. But interestingly, the links are all rational homology spheres and all the feelings have B1 equal to zero. So in particular, you have to use some more subtle information to say that you are not a Milner fiber, right? You can't just use homology. And in fact, the only, we can only show that we are not Milner fibers relative, that our feelings are not diffeomorphic to Milner fibers relative to boundary. So slightly weaker than absolute state. Okay. Any questions? Sort of like talking into the void. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about what those rational singularities that reduced fundamental cycle are. I will give you kind of topological definition via the resolution graph. So we talked about how to singularity you can associate a resolution and the corresponding plumbing graph would describe the topology of the singularity. So this is what I'm going to use now, right? So remember a picture like this means that your exceptional divisor in the resolution has a collection of surfaces that are marked by the vertices of this graph. The numbers stand for self-intersections and I did not put the genus anywhere. A priori, you could have exceptional curves of higher genus, but for these singularities, I require that each exceptional curve has genus zero. So this, graph describes the plumbing of spheres, okay, plumbing of disk bundles over spheres, okay. So we require that the resolution graph be a tree, that every exceptional curve have genus zero, and one key condition is that you have a relation between how many other curves each exceptional curve intersects and each and its framing. So the self-intersection should have satisfied this, should satisfy this inequality with respect to the valency. So for example, what's not allowed, this is a bad vertex. This is, you have the self-intersection negative two, but you have three edges coming out. That's bad. You would not be allowed more than two edges. And in fact, if you are doing Hegel floor homology, something similar, people sometimes call these bad vertices and they also use condition, this condition for certain special three manifolds. Right. The picture I have up top, this is a good one though, because you can check that for each vertex, this is satisfied, right? I have negative three self-intersections, three edges coming out. So this is a basic set of conditions on the resolution graph. If I have these conditions, I say that I have a rational singularity with reduced fundamental cycle, the type of the singularity that I will work with. Okay, questions? Okay, so why this class of singularities? Well, uh, I told you that we focus on these because both algebraic geometry is relatively simple and the symplectic geometry is simple. And importantly for me, I'm interested in Milner fibers, right? I'm interested to compare Milner fibers and Stein fillings. And if I ask this question, what are the Milner fibers? What is the deformation theory? This is a difficult question in algebraic geometry. Right? And luckily in this case, for this class of singularities, the deformation theory is understood. 
So we already have input of some known results as what the smoothings are. Okay. This is not exactly a classification. It's not like a list of smoothings, but it's a very attractive construction, which allows you to describe the deformation of the surface singularity via deformation of an associated curve singularity. So you're going one dimension down. You start with the surface going you're constructing an associated single plane curve with some decorations and weights and this is local everything is local you're looking at some germ and it turns out that then you play with these curves you can basically draw pictures and this describes to you all the smoothings that tells you something about the topology of Miller curves so this input comes from the work of Dion van Straten uh, back in the late 90s and they do something which is actually a little bit more general than what I'm stating, but this is good enough for us. Okay. So this is why we can get a good grasp of the algebraic geometry and of the deformation theory. On the other hand, the symplectic topology is also nice and relatively easy because, as I said before, the contact length of the singularity admits a planar open book. Okay. I hope people know about open books, right? And uh, in this case, there's a very nice theorem of Chris Wendell that tells us that all time fillings can be described by luscious vibration with the same planar fiber. So you could, for any contact manifold to any open book, you could start looking at positive factorizations, build luscious vibrations, but typically you need stabilizations, and this is completely out of out of control. For planar open books, you do not need stabilizations. You look at this one planar open book, the page of the open book has a disk with holes, and all feelings can be described by these particular left vibrations. So basically, you need to understand positive factorizations of the monodromy of the planar open book. Again, it's not quite a classification. It, even when you reduce to this factorization question, you don't know exactly how to list all factorizations. It's a difficult question, but it's something. It's easier than dealing with the more general things. Okay. Uh, so we use these two parts, the input from the algebraic geometry and the input from the symplectic geometry. And what we do is basically use these planar open books and Lepsius vibrations to build a symplectic analog of this theory up top of the one Stratton theory. And to describe Stein fillings via some deformations of certain curve arrangements. They're not going to be algebraic geometry deformations. They're going to be something just like smooth, something more, uh, more flexible. Uh, and then you can, you just see the symplectic topology, symplectic fillings are described by deformations of curve arrangements under the one sense and the smooth sense. And the deformations of the surface, the Milner fibers are understood by algebraic geometry deformations of this similar curve, and then we could make the comparison. Okay, so this is the plan. Okay. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the Jung van Straten theory, and I think Laura in her morning talk gave a nice description, but I don't think I have the same people here, so I'll go over this. Okay. Uh, so, like I said, you have a surface singularity, you would like to describe deformations where the deformations of some curve. So where does this picture come from? Where does the curve come from? Okay. So I start with the graph of the resolution, right? So the plumbing graph. And because of this condition, which we always work with, always restrict to this particular class of singularities, I can augment my resolution graph by adding negative one surfaces to a graph that would represent just a blow up of C2. Okay. So I think I've made a nice picture here, but let me check, right? So I put in the negative one vertices. If I start blowing down, I'm gonna get negative one. So this is blow down. I get negative one, negative three, negative one, and then I can just blow down completely to nothing, right? Just blow down to negative one and that's it, okay? And it's a simple, it's really a combinatorial argument. If you have this condition here, you can always do the segmentation through in the extra negative one vertices and make this, right? Okay, and then 
I want to record, I want to kind of keep track of what my graph was, keep track of my singularity. So for this, after I've put in these minus one surface, uh, minus one additional minus one vertices, correspond to minus one curves. So this picture, the bottom sort of more slightly less schematic picture for the exceptional divisor, you have the spheres of negative two, negative three, negative three intersection. You add these red spheres, which are rational curves, which have negative one intersection. And then I want to remember what I added. So I put some transverse disks, some kind of additional sort of slices on these minus one curves. And as I blow down, I'm going to keep track of these little disks. Right? So I do the blow down here. I first blow down the minus one curves here. So then the blue guys go on these spheres and the frame exchange. I blow down again. I get the minus one. And these two blue curves pass through one point now. And then I blow down again. The two blue guys become tangent. And the other one come, goes through the same point. This is how I get it. So this is this curved germ that we looked for. Okay. So it's not too difficult to see that you could reverse this process. And if you are given the curved germ, you could get the resolution graph. Moreover, if you're interested in just the topology, you sort of have all the information in almost in like the tangencies and the intersections, how many components, very little information that you need. If you're interested in the analytic structure, you need to know a little bit more than the resolution graph. You sort of need to know the analytic structure of all of these curves here, and that would give you the analytic structure on the analytic structure on the, the curve. So you're going to get the algebraic geometry thing here. Okay. Questions? So the, again, a little bit more of combinatorics shows that for this class of singularities, you can always get the curve here, which has smooth branches. If you're not careful, you could start getting cusps when you blow down. But if you know what you're doing, you can get smooth branches. And that's good. The resultant curve is not quite unique. It depends on some combinatorial choices. But you could use any realization. And eventually, it would provide you the same information. I know this is a little bit confusing. I would like to do an even simpler example, right? So this is for the link of a quotient singularity, which is just this familiar lens space, L for one. Okay. So the resolution graph is just one exceptional curve, one sphere with one, one rational curve with self-intersection negative one. This is the Kirby calculus description that every topologist knows. Right? So then how do I go through this process? So what was I told to do? I was told to add the minus one curves to augment the graph. Okay, So I'm going to put in three things. Right? Why do I do it like this? Well, because when I blow up the minus ones, I get just one minus one curve. And then I blow down more, it blows down to nothing. Right? Again, just if. It's easier to see the graph. This is going to be a graph. Maybe I can do it here. So that's it. You can see that you can blow this down completely. Okay. And then I'm going to put in the these blue transverse slices. And then I'm going to start blowing down. So I blow down once. I get this minus four curve becomes minus one. This is called the frame exchange. The red minus ones disappear, and the blue disks come to intersect the minus one curve. They intersect at three different points, of course, because they lived on different minus one curves. Okay. And then I blow down one more, once more. And what happens is that the minus one curve disappears. I am now in just C2. And these blue curves just become lines that go through one point. Okay. This making sense? So this is this is the this 
last picture is the curve that I associate to the singularity, to the quotient singularity whose length has L. My notes say something about weights, and it's a little bit important. I need to record how many blow downs each of these curves went through. So I'm going to say it's two, two, two. Okay. And let me maybe add a page here and show you real quick why. Oops why this is important because okay because if i had i think a graph like this to begin with negative four negative two i would augment it to negative four negative two negative one negative one negative one and you can see that i would have sort of these blue things attached to each of these. And as I blow down, I would have very similar, very similar picture with this minus one, minus one, minus one. Okay. Uh, so I would end up with this same configuration of lines intersecting at one point, except that this last thing, this, the, this one of these blue curves would go through an additional blow down due to the fact that there's a negative two curve. Okay. So I would, if I do the blow down for you, I would have, I would have, sorry, uh, negative two, negative one, and then one, two, three, and then a blow down. Right? So I would end up with the same exact configuration, but one of the curves would go through an additional blow down. So the weights would be like this. And that's important because of course, to begin with the singularity is different. The length is different. The topological type is different. So I want to record a little bit more than just the curve. These weights are also important for the topology. Okay. So that's, the first picture is for alpha one, the second picture is for something more complicated. Everybody okay? All right, so I've constructed the curve and what's the point of the curve is that now I can use this curve to find the Milner fibers for my singularity, to really to encode all deformations of the surface singularity, okay? And for this, I need to deform this curve, this curve germ that describes the singularity. So what kind of curve deformations are allowed? Well, first of, we are looking at the algebraic deformation. So think of this as really each, the, this, is, this is a plain algebraic curve in C2. So think of it as being given by algebraic equations. You basically deform the equations to get a deformation and you're not allowed to merge components. So you're not allowed to say, okay, this singular thing is going to deform to smooth conics. This is not allowed. You keep each component separately, right? Deform each component separately. And you want to get to a situation where whatever tangencies you have get resolved. So you only have transverse multiple points in the resolution. You could have a triple intersection or whatever, but you cannot have tangencies. And then these weights, the, these sort of numbers that label each component, they become important because you need to think of it as the weight as kind of mark point that uh, mark points that are initially concentrated at zero, and you redistribute them so that each curve gets as many marked points as you have the number as is indicated by this weight, but you need to label all the intersection points by the, mark, by the mark points. So that's important and that restricts what deformations you're allowed to do because you can imagine that in the very generic deformation, you might have too many intersection points. And if it so happens that your weights are low, then you would not, allow, you would not be allowed to do that. Okay, so let's do this in, let's, do this in our example here with alpha one. So I'm gonna first focus on this middle part. Okay, this one. So I have this curve 
And I told you I have to deform this construction to get transverse intersections. This is already a transverse intersection. So I could in principle just leave the picture as is, but I should put marked points on the intersection and some free marked points. Or I could deform this triple intersection to three double intersections and put these guys, put more labeled intersection points. Right? So this tells me that there are two smoothings that I have, at least sort of schematically, this suggests that I have Milner fibers corresponding to two smoothings because these curve deformations by the Duyon one stratum picture encode all smoothings. If I had, I believe this is L51 and two, 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 right? I would be allowed to do this, but I would not be allowed to, actually, I'm not allowed to do this. This is not allowed. because of the weights, right? If I wanted to do this deformation, I would have to put three intersection points on one of the lines and each line is only allowed to have two. So this is not allowed. And for L51, you would have only one picture, right? Which incidentally corresponds to the fact that if you know about lens spaces, L51 only has one fitting, does not have two, you do not expect L4, L41 has two fittings like you expect from these pictures. L51 only has one. Okay. So that's, that fits. Okay. okay. Any questions? Now, these pictures are a little bit mysterious and I told you they correspond to Milner fibers, but like what exactly do you, how do you get the Milner fiber? What, what, how do you see the topology? Well, you can reconstruct the Milner fiber by the following procedure. Again, this goes back to the gamma stratton You blow up all of these marked points that we have. And this means that you blow up all the intersection points plus you blow up whatever extra mark points you have. And then you end up in the blow up of C2. And then you take the complement of proper transforms of these curves. So basically you look at these curves, lift them upstairs to the blow up, and then you take out the tubular neighborhood of, of those proper transforms. And it turns out that what you got is exactly the Milner fiber with the corresponding smoothing. Okay. I would like to give you a different description, which will be more familiar and more useful to us, you could use this configuration of curves that we have, and I'm back to this L for one example, and put a leftist vibration structure on the Milner fiber construction, this blow up minus the tubular neighborhoods of the proper transforms. If you do this, the leftist vibration allows you to see the Stein structure as well as topology. So what you have is, suppose you just have this first, just have this curve in C2, right? You can try to look at the complement of these guys, right? So away from, this, away from the intersection points, you could say, okay, the complement, like maybe over a large circle, you have a vibration with the fiber given just by the plane, just by C, uh, with the holes cut out where you remove the intersection of the proper transform or with, the, with these curves where you just sort of puncture the planes. Right? So you would have away from the intersections, you're already seeing the vibration with planar fiber, just with holes, but in the middle, you sort of have these intersections that you don't know how to deal with. When you, let me remove this page here and then it will be, Okay. So if I just remove the branches, I have the surface bundle over the circle with this fiber, which is a punctured plane okay. or disc with holes if you're looking at the compact version. Okay. After the blow ups, 
what happens? Well, I'm blowing up the intersection points, which means that I'm separating, you know, the transverse intersection means that they come in with different slopes. So after the blow up, I have in the, the proper transforms, I have the proper transforms that do not intersect, okay? And that puncture the exceptional curves at different points, right? So each uh, intersection point here in the blow up contributes uh, contributes a fiber in this vibration, which will have this sort of left shift singularity, which would have this kind of left shift singularity, and which would still be, which would still have holes corresponding to the intersections with the lines. Okay. So the upshot is that the Milner fiber is now given by left shift vibration with planar fibers, uh, and the Planar fiber is a disk with holes. How many holes? Just as many as you have branches of your curve. Okay. And the vanishing cycles, the critical points of the left shift vibration, I exactly the one-to-one -one correspondence with the intersection points in my in my deformed curve, in my curve arrangement. Okay. So this is actually a pretty hands-on construction. You could also see the open book on the boundary of this. This would be given essentially the mapping torus part would be given by the surface bundle that we started with over large circle. So this curve, this the young one strat and description of looking at the deformed curve gives you a very hands-on description uh, of the corresponding Milner fiber together with the Stein structure in terms of the left shift vibration, vanishing cycles open book on the boundary, you get everything, all right? Any questions at this point? If everybody understands everything, no one understands anything. All right, okay. So, but now you also get an idea that you could, okay, maybe before we get that idea, let's look at this example once more and let's recap what we just did. So for this, uh, length space uh, thought of as a length of a quotient singularity given by this resolution graph. So I told you, we look at this picture for this, uh, the Yonwa Stratton uh, curve, germ of, the, germ of the curve. You look at the two deformations like this and like this with the mark points corresponding to these twos here. And then I'm going to build as it tell me here, left shift vibration of planar fibers, holes corresponds to branches of the curve. So the page, the fiber of the left shift vibration is going to be a disk with three holes and the vanishing cycles correspond to the intersection points and the additional mark points. So what do I get here? The additional mark points, they involve just one line each. So I'm gonna have these three vanishing cycles going around one hole in the disk each and this, intersection points, intersection point that includes all of these three curves passing through, this is gonna be this large vanishing cycle, uh, which is the curve going around all of the three holes. Right? And similarly, this one, I have again a disc with three holes because of three branches, even in the original picture. And the vanishing cycles and the left shift vibration described in the Milner fiber correspond to the intersection points here. So I get, I get these three vanishing cycles enclosed in two holes each. So that's good. Okay. So recap again, you start basically, let's state this picture more generally. You start with the surface singularity you get the germ of the singular complex curve, it's smooth components and weights. Uh, you make the curve deformations like this, right? And this is a notch bar construction at this point. And you get a Milner filling equipped with a left shift vibration. And the main result of the Young von Stratton is that you get all the smoothings this way. So both like each of these pictures gives you smoothing and all smoothings, all Milner fibers come from one of these constructions. 
The one-to-one -one correspondence of equation here, it's a little bit subtle. I don't have an equivalence relation, which would tell you if I have two different curves, I would definitely get two different smoothings. We don't know about that, but at least we know that we generate everything by these pictures. Okay. And now what? Now we can move on to arbitrary time feelings. And you can see that everything we did here, especially with the left shot vibrations, we don't really need, we are never using the algebraic equations. We might as well use smooth graphical homotopies. Right? When I tell you, let's look at this picture and the open book on the boundary is really what tells you what contact manifold you're working with. This surface bundle over the circle is telling you the map and torus part of the open book is encoding the left sets is encoding the open book for you. And what these intersection points do is basically encode the monorail factorization. So then if I think about it this way, there's no need for algebraic equations. I could just sort of start with this germ like this and say, I'm gonna just kind of do smooth graphical homotopies and this is not terribly different in terms of topology from what I had before, but you get the idea that if I have a picture like this, I could still say, okay, I have this bundle with the same fiber over the large circle. I blow up the intersection points. I build the left shift vibration. So, okay. Here I would get exactly the same left shift vibration because the incidences between the curves tell me what vanishing cycles to put in but I could, in general, hope to get something more general. Okay. So if you think you do need to keep these kind of weight restrictions, what you do not want to do is to get a situation where you have maybe an extra intersection here between curves, something like this, because this would mean that you would add, like you would have to add some negative in the kind of negative intersection points, kind of negative vanishing cycles, right? You would have you would have to have something like this, and then this would not be known as left vibration. So you do. It's important to keep track of how many intersections you have. Right. So the next idea that you get is that from this generalized construction, once you allow the more general deformations of the curve, these smooth graphical deformations, you can get every Stein feeling from the generalized construction. Why is that? Well, I already said that you have this Wendel's theorem that tells you that you generate all Stein fillings and even all minimal symplectic fillings from left shift vibrations with the same planar fiber. So it's really about working with a monodromy, positive monodromy factorization of this monodromy given by the singular plane curve, pretty much. So if I could start with an arbitrary monodromy factorization associated to a given Stein feeling, associated to a given Lefschetz vibration, I could try to reverse engineer a curve arrangement, something like this, which would encode my monodromy factorization, which would encode the feeling. Right? So how would I do this? So first, I'm just building this diagrammatically. Right? Uh, so I have. Uh, so maybe I have a left shift vibration like this with two vanishing cycles and two day and twist, so two the factorization into two positive day and twist d1 and d2. So that's easy because I sort of say, okay, I need to twist this long. And remember, we said that an intersection point between disks correspond to putting a vanishing cycle, putting a day and twist. So I can say, okay, at least schematically, I need to have an intersection between these two guys. And then I need to have an intersection between these two guys to account for the second interest. Okay. If I have something more complicated like this picture, again, I have a two day twists, but I can no longer use this picture because then I would kind of just need to, this would correspond to just this simple twist. And here's some conjugacy here. I can take care of this conjugacy by introducing some braiding. So you can sort of see this goes around this 
pole. So I'm gonna just send the second strand around the first and then intersect with the third. So I can make the schematic braid picture, they're called braided barring diagrams, where the intersection points would correspond to the vanishing cycles I'm trying to construct. And the braiding would kind of correspond to pinning down the exact conjugate sequence. And then what are these braids? They're really sort of not what I want because the Yeoman stratum gives me complex disks, com pieces of complex curves. Here, I'm not getting complex curves, but I could extend this to kind of like surfaces to make at least smooth graphical. And if you're careful with sort of choosing coordinates, you can make, you can make these, you can extend these braided things to pieces of symplectic disks. So you can make an arrangement of symplectic disks that captures the required monodromy. And you can make intersections positive so that really when you repeat this construction, blow up and take out the proper transforms, you would get the left shift vibration that we are trying to reconstruct. Okay. Questions about this? I think this is getting into the harder stuff and more confusing, but please ask if there's anything I could explain better. Cynthia, I could ask a quick question. Sure. Um, is the reason for looking at these deformations, the de Jong van Straten deformations, so that you can find a way to like construct Stein fillings that are, you have something algebraic, you construct a Stein filling out of that, and then you generalize it so you get Stein fillings that are not algebraic. Is that is that the idea? Well, this is yes, this is the idea. I think the original idea is even that as you approach this question of comparing algebraic fillings, or comparing Milner fibers to symplectic fillings, how do you even know something about the algebraic geometry of deformation and smoothings? So it's very helpful to have this input of the young one strata. This is one thing. And second is like you said, because we have this nice curve germ and the description of algebraic picture from the deformation of the, that curve germ, what I'm doing right now, I'm trying to repeat almost the same construction except with relaxed conditions, except in the smooth setting rather than algebraic to construct old Stein feelings, to construct all symplectic fillings. Yes. And then I'm gonna hopefully in the next five minutes, I'm gonna be able to actually compare them a little bit. Okay. Thank you. More questions? Uh, so one other remark in the day on one start, and I was really telling you that you're looking at not just starting with this germ, but doing algebraic deformations, forming equations. Here, I don't have anything as strong as that, but I could say that because really the monodromy of the boundary is something that's fixed, is something that comes from the uh, open book decomposition, I could kind of just, and the disks are smooth graphical, I could just sort of homotope them graphically to this germ while keeping the boundary fixed. So there is a notion, instead of a deformation, I have the notion of homotoping them in a very easy way with no restrictions during the homotopy. Okay. And so the theorem that we proved with Laura is that all Stein feelings come from this construction of taking the curve germ given by the one strata and applying more relaxed versions of deformation, applying smooth graphical homotopies to get a smooth disk arrangement or symplectic if you like, but simplex is really not essential here, that would generate all Stein feelings. Okay, questions? So the upshot is that we have two parts. One is from the Yonwa stratum for Milner feelings, which tells you what I just said, take the curve, with weights, whatever, do the algebraic deformation and you get the complex disk arrangement, pieces of complex curves, and then you can reconstruct the feelings. And what we have for Stein feelings is a very similar procedure. Again, start with the same germ, algebraic germ, but apply a more relaxed version of the deformation, smooth graphical homotopy, and get a smooth disk arrangement with marked points, sort of this picture which is a little bit more flexible, but then you reconstruct the film by exactly the same procedure. Okay. 
So what you want to do now is really capture the difference. What's the difference between this picture in the bottom and the picture up top, between the algebraic setting and the symplectic setting? What is the difference between Stein feelings and Milner feelings that come from smoothing some resolution? Right? Any questions about this slide? This is general. Maybe this answers Catherine's question. So, sorry, can you just go back just to the statement of the of the theorem? I, I just. Yes. Okay. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Okay, I'm happy. All right. Everybody good? Okay. So I want to spend a few minutes, a few last minutes, telling you about the difference because this is really the most interesting part, I think. Uh, and I will focus on just the situation when the germ is just a pencil of lines. Right? There are some weights here, but I just have the this picture, no like complicated equations, just I started the pencil of lines, and the corresponding length of the singularity would have a star-shaped resolution graph. You can experiment with this, I don't have time, but it's really easy to see that as you sort of start with the star-shaped picture, a lot of minus negative two framings, when you add the minus ones in the end, you can blow everything down and you sort of have these uh, curve, pieces of curves coming down and forming the lines. Nothing becomes tangent because they live on different legs of the, of the pl plumbing graph, basically. Right. So the Milner feelings by this digger monstratum thing that I described come from deformations of this pencil of lines. Uh, except that important to say this picture is local. So these guys are just sort of local picture. And when I deform them, I deform the algebraic equation, but please do not think of this as a complex line arrangement in CP2. This is not a closed situation. This is, I just sort of mean, I'm just doing the local things. So this is a germ of open disks. And when I'm doing the deformation, higher order terms are allowed. We'll see in a moment how this is, uh, how this works. So the Milner fillings, even in the simple situation, you have, you don't just look at complex line arrangements. That would be easy, but you look at something more general. So let me throw some projective geometry at you. So this is, I believe this is nine lines. This is the classical Pappas arrangement. And you can say, well, this is definitely, if I just start with a pencil of nine lines, I can't do nine, but you can imagine, right? This is definitely an algebraic deformation because this is just a linear deformation, right? I just linearly deform this configuration of lines with different slopes to something that looks like this. I know I have to bother with the weights, but let's say the weights are large enough that I can accommodate enough intersection for this. Okay. So this Pappos arrangement picture definitely gives you a Milner feeling of the corresponding length of the singularity of the corresponding suffix fiber space. Okay. Now let me do something that's called pseudo Pappos. Okay. It has, so the classical Pappus theorem tells you that if you draw all of these black lines, you start with two lines, and there are some extra intersections I have not drawn, but never mind, and then make this construction, the three red points lie on the same line. Okay? If I make a curvy kind of line, which avoids this point in the middle, this here, right, then this is not realizable by one complex line. But I claim that this is still okay for the digger one stratum deformation because you can take the straight lines and you can add a higher order term like something, I don't know, z squared, whatever, right? To just kind of bump it up a little bit, make it a higher degree polynomial that just sort of curves this disk a little bit so that it avoids this point. And here it's very important the picture is local. Because usually if I looked at CP2, I would have a higher degree polynomial giving me a higher genus curve. It would not be a disk, but I don't care because I'm just looking at the little neighborhood and I can arrange them. So this kind of pictures, interestingly, also give you Milner fibers. They're also algebraic. Okay. All right. And then the interesting question, I know I'm past time, but just give me a couple of minutes. Uh, when don't you give a, get a Milner feeling? Because now it looks like you can approximate 
almost anything by polynomials, right? And even if I give you some curvy lines, you could still get it by algebraic, get it by an algebraic construction. Well, the point is that during the algebraic deformation, you, by definition, you keep the topology of the arrangement to be the same. So you need to say, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna start with these lines and then all the, for time which is non zero, as long as you move on or move off this first singular picture, you have to have the same topological construction. In the deformation, all the non special fibers should look exactly the same topologically. Right? And this also means that I need to have this condition of remember the positive intersections of complex curves and the weight restrictions, all of this holds throughout. Right? But my construction for the time fillings just said that I start with this and I can change the topology. I don't care. I really just sort of keep going and move these curves around as long as I keep the boundary, as long as I keep the total monodromy. And as long as this positivity holds on the final arrangement where I need to make sure that my monodromy factorization after all only involves positive interests, right? As long as I get in the end, I'm fine because I don't care what happens during the homotopy. The purpose of the homotopy is just to keep the same monodromy of the boundary open. There's no restrictions during, uh, during the time of the homotopy. So this is how this is more general. And I'll throw it to you this one last picture, which is giving you something which is a smooth graphical homotopy, but not a, an algebraic deformation. So I'm going to have 10 lines with distinct slopes. And I'm going to look at this. This is kind of complicated, but I start with almost the same arrangement as Papus. So all of these black lines. And then I put in a blue line, which has a different slope from all the other lines. I put this intersection point and I make the red line. This cannot be an honest complex line because an honest complex line by Papas would have to go through point A, but I bend it and make it go through point B. Right? And it's, it should be absolutely clear that I have no problem at all realizing this is a graphical homotopy of this, right? I sort of deform it a little bit to make an almost Papas and then I bend this. And so I can do this by preserving the, this monodromy of the open book and still generate the Stein feeling out of this. Uh, but I claim that this arrangement cannot appear via an algebraic deformation. And using that fact, I can show that we, Laura and I showed that the corresponding Stein feeling is not deferomorphic relative to the boundary to any Milner theory. Some intuition why is that basically, if you wanted to generate this picture by an algebraic deformation, and I think about collapsing, maybe going back, collapsing this algebraically to this pencil of lines. Well, because the red thing would kind of have to go through A, you would need to collapse A and B. And then that would mean that the slope of the blue line would have to kind of go here. This is intuition. This is, I don't know if it makes sense at all. This is not a proof, but this sort of, this is a reason why this cannot be an algebraic deformation, okay? Uh, last slide that I will show and then I will stop. Uh, the arrangements, the line arrangements that generate these unexpected feelings that are Stein but not Miller is have this interesting property that somehow you want to build an arrangement of something like lines, pseudo lines that have an incidence pattern that cannot be realized by any complex line arrangement in the sense which is a little bit different from realizability question of symplectic arrangement versus complex arrangements. What I want to say is that every time I sort of the arrangements that could be realized by Milner feelings is when you have every intersection in arrangement P corresponding to some intersection of the same lines in L in the complex line arrangement, the complex line arrangement is allowed to have extra incidences. But so here, if you allow, even if you allow extra incidences, there's no way to realize it by complex lines, it would all collapse to just this, okay? 
So this is somehow why this does not work. And this arrangement works because it's not unexpected in this sense. I could take the complex line arrangement given by the actual purpose, and then they encode all of these incidences plus more where this line goes through the, the point. And this is why that sort of works. Okay. So the last theorem is the punchline, but I should really stop now and take questions. So thanks for listening. Thank Olga for the great talk. Thank you. Somebody in the chat, Marco has a question, please. Hello. Yes. Hello? So I wanted to ask, uh, so there is work of Fomin, uh, Plevisky, Shustin, and Thurston, where a cluster algebra is associated to, I think, any, any link of an isolated singularity. Uh, and I wanted to ask, so that there are some uh, wiring diagrams that show up all, also there. I wanted to ask if uh, there is a direct connection to the ones you drew uh, besides the, the formal similarity. So I unfortunately know nothing about the cluster algebras. Uh, one thing that might be helpful is to remember that my, my pictures are very, very special. I only look at the special, very special case of rational singularity that use fundamental cycle, which means that I'm looking at very, very special resolution graphs. So if they have somehow the same condition, then we would be very interested to see if there's any connection. If they don't have that condition, likely there's no relation at all because these pictures can only be constructed for this. You really need this shape of the resolution graph to even begin to build these pictures. So that's, that's all I can say, appreciate it. Thank you. Mark, uh, Lawrence has a question, go ahead. Hi, Olga. Um, <clears throat> if you have a Milner filling, then in local coordinates, this is a polynomially convex set. So that must have some topological uh, consequences. Do, are your other fillings possibly sets that which could not be polynomially convex for topological reasons? So I don't know what, what are the topological reasons that you're thinking about? You might have some strong conditions that I'm not aware of. Well, actually, I'm not sure because I know, you know there's something about domains in C2, but I don't know about varieties, but surely there are, there are conditions, so. so. I only know this one basic condition, which is that Milner fibers should have vanishing first beta number. Okay. And this is what this is the examples from Mark Meadow for Zbakchi that I mentioned in the beginning, where if the singularity is not rational, it's more complicated, they could construct, they can construct time feelings which do not have the vanishing first beta number. And then you're in business, you know that those cannot be Miller fibers. For me, it's more subtle because the link is a rational homology sphere. I know that all time feelings just from homology, they do have the vanishing first beta number. So at least that mm -hmm. abstraction does not tell me anything. And also I can, with just a little bit of taking care of how I make the construction, I can build a lot of simply connected Stein feelings that are not Milner fibers. And that tends to sort of rule out some basic topological abstractions as well, I believe. But maybe you're thinking of something more powerful, I don't know. Okay. Uh... If I can make it precise, I'll email you a question. That would be great. So. Thank you. Could, could you go maybe just back a couple slides to where you talked about, you know, uh, isotopies that preserved the, the topological data versus the algebraic? Yeah, the, yeah, the, this thing here, right? The, so the picture of the papus, which one? The, well, no, no, just, just where you were, just a, just a second ago. Sorry, yeah, this is uh, a lag on this, so yeah, okay. Yeah, right, yes, just, just, just right there. Sure. So um, is there something that measures how far the result is away? I mean, maybe you said this, right? But um, you, you, you don't need the, the algebraic deformation, but is there something on the result which measures how far away it was from the algebraic uh, deformation? I think it's an interesting, question and I don't have the full answer. We actually spent quite a bit on this. So I told you that we are doing a smooth graphical homotopy, which 
during doing the homotopy, you might lose all the weight restrictions, you might lose all the positivity. And we actually spent quite a bit of time and we thought that maybe you could realize this smooth graphical homotopy mm. via maybe some J holomorphic curves in mm. some appropriate, mm. uh, almost complex structure. And if mm. you could have that, then you would even have the, this, the weights are preserved and the positivity is preserved. So it would really be a question of allowing a topology change which seems to be crucial here. Or maybe, so the weights, I think we have pictures where, it's kind of very subtle, so it's difficult to answer, but I mean, you could, if you allow the changes of topology, you could deform this into this, but you would have to go through sort of some intermediate pictures where this red line goes maybe like this, so you would introduce kind of extra intersections. You would have mm -hmm. to go through high weights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, this would be one of the reasons why something changes, why there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Because if, so if nothing happens, if just the topology changes and the weights are satisfied, you mm -hmm. can actually sort of see what happens during the homotopy at the level of the of the corresponding time feeling, you do something like symplectic blowdown when mm -hmm. you change the topology of the mm -hmm. line arrangement when you go through an intersection point. Mm -hmm. And if you do not satisfy the weights, if you have to introduce some kind of negative intersections to compensate, then you would get something which is like an acarial left shift vibration, which has negative mm -hmm. twists, mm -hmm. and you will go through there. And sort of, we're not sure if we could have a stronger setting, like I said, where you go through j holomorphic curves and mm -hmm. make some of the conditions mm -hmm. more restricted and you actually have mm -hmm. honest left shift vibrations just changing mm -hmm. topology. Mm -hmm. But the algebraic, the Milner fiber sort of say, I, I'm deforming immediately from the single point into the Milner fiber. Mm -hmm. And maybe another thing that's related here is really makes you think how the time feelings are different from Milner fibers because studying the Milner fibers is a deformation question, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever this means, you look at this complex singular point and you need to deform it immediately into a Milner fiber. Mm -hmm. When you ask a Stein feelings question, a Stein feeling is not related, it's not to any kind of deformation process where it has to be related to the deformation of the original singular point. Mm -hmm. And this really tells you that it should be different because, well, if it's not related to deformation, if it does not know about the original Singular point, then of course you might have more stuff. And maybe this is what we're seeing here. Thank it you. would be very interesting to have the notion of uh, symplectic deformation of a singular point. I don't think mm -hmm. we have the theory for that. But if you mm -hmm. had a theory for like symplectic def de deformation of a singularity, a good question would be to compare the symplectic deformations to mm -hmm. Milner fibers. That would really be difference between the algebraic and the symplectic setting. But I think the symplectic side is not even, we don't even have the definition. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, um... Let's see if there are uh, no further questions. Uh, let's thank uh, Olga again and we can switch to the discussion section. <laughs>